Hi hires, we are trying to look at translation. I'm saying trying because I know this one is a difficult one in the DNA and the genome unit. Right, so you've made it through transcription. In transcription, you managed to take a nucleic acid code in your DNA, ATGC coding, and you've converted it into RNA nucleic acid code. So we've got AUGC, but now we need to change it into a different type of code. So exactly like you would think about translating a language, we are going to translate this into a different code. Okay, and the code we're looking for now is amino acid code. So amino acids are called amino acids because they have two different functional groups, an amine group and an acid group. Okay, here's your amine and here's your acid. You don't need to worry about it too much. Um, if you're doing chemistry, then you will look at this in a bit more detail. But all we need to know is that we have these kind of chemicals. Now, what you do have here that is important is this letter here. Now, R in this case means variable. So what we're saying is that can change. You always have the amine group. You always have the acid group, but that R group could change. So it could be something as simple as a hydrogen, or it could be something that's got like a big long chain with a charge, or it could have different codes in there, like different circles and different things that are going to make that amino acid behave differently. And if they behave differently, then that means that you get a different protein. And that's why the code is important, because if we put in the wrong amino acid, then the protein won't be able to do what you want it to do, which we're going to talk about a lot in the mutation bit. OK, so basic structure of a protein. They are polymers. OK, a polymer just meaning that it's a long thing made up of lots of little things. The little things are the amino acids. They are the monomers. OK, so a lot of polymers are quite simple because they're just made of just one thing, like starch is just made up of loads of glucoses. The structure can be quite complicated. They can branch off in things, but basically it's just one monomer. But amino acids, there are about 20. OK, and that means that you get everything you can possibly imagine, every bit of protein that you can think of, every type of protein that you find in so many different places, plant protein, animal protein, and in each and every form you get them in, because you've got 20 different amino acids and you can put them in as long a thing as you want and you can put them in whatever order you like. You can do just about anything with it. So it's a really complicated code, but it's amazing what it can give you. So they could be quite small or they could be massive. OK, and even then, the big ones, you could join them together to make even bigger ones. So the potential is huge. So to stick them together, now you just need to know the term peptide bond. OK, it would be nice if you could see how this is happening. But again, if you're doing chemistry, definitely you need to know it. If you're not, then it's just nice if you can see what's going on. So what we've got here is making the polymer is done by a process called condensation. So what we're doing is we are cutting off the ends of two bits so that we've got some way that they can stick together. This is a peptide bond. OK, so if I look at the next link, OK, here's here's one of these other amino acids that we showed the general formula for this one here. That would be the other bit there. OK, so what you're going to do is you're going to cut out this which means that you free up a bond end and a bond end and then they stick together, which gives you that. OK, but you'll notice that we always have. A C then an N, a C then an N, a C then an N, it always goes the same way. So actually we have an end to the to the chain, which we can talk about, which is the N terminus and the C terminus. Again, you don't need to worry about it, but if you're doing chemistry, then yeah. OK, and what this does is just keeps on joining more and more and more of them together. Once you've got a few of them, then we stop just saying that it's a peptide. We start saying this is a polypeptide. And if you remember like your PPP, protein, pepsin, polypeptides, and your breakdown stuff from that five, that's what we're going to. So a polypeptide is just several peptide bonds all joined up. Oh, and we've got here strong covalent. So our R groups, as I mentioned, this is really important because they decide what's going to actually happen in the protein. Everything else is the same. So it's like your DNA. Your DNA has sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. The backbone is the same everywhere. But obviously one bit of 
DNA is coding for something totally different because the sequence is different. The bit that changes is the bases. So this is the same thing. What's changing is that R group. And see, it could be simple, could be something a lot more complicated. That bit matters. Right, so here's our problem. Okay, nucleic acid only has four letters. We know that, that that's that's in DNA. We're just looking A, T, G, and C, or A, U, G, and C if we're looking at RNA. Okay. Amino acids, we've got 20 odd, and we need to be able to say stop. That's really important. So how do you manage to do that? If we start with saying, okay, fine, let's do it just as one letter, one one word, as it were. So we go A, U, G, C. That means that I can say, well, let's take the top four here, phenylalanine, leucine, serine, and tyrosine. I am done, and I've only said four things, and I need to say more than that. So you say, right, okay, well, let's try a two-letter code. So we can go AA, AU, AG, AC, and UU, U, AUG, UC, and uh, we're going C, 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 A, C, U, C, G, uh, oh, C, G, and we can do the same with the G's, G, A, G, C, G, U, and G, G. I can now say 16 things. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, still struggling. Okay, so I can't go for two letter codes. So you're like, right, okay, well then maybe I have to go with three. A, 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 U. And if you do that, if you do that to the whole thing, we actually end up with 64 possible combinations. 64 is more than 20. That's how I get around it. But now I've got more than 20. So what I need to now do with that is I start using extras. So like this one here, glycine has GGU, GGC, GGA and GGG. All of these code for glycine. And we've got valine over here, it gets four. Alanine gets four. Glutamine only gets two. Asparagine only gets two. Serine gets four. And we've got, most importantly, over here, we've got a couple of stops and another stop over here. We can say everything now. And the ones that are most common get extra codes. OK, so you're, we have what's now called redundancy in the code. And again, that's something that we are going to talk about a little bit in mutation. It means that we have extras. We have ways around it if something goes wrong. And that's why we now have these triplet codes. So triplet codes are called codons. You're going to have to use that term a lot. OK, so in DNA, the original sequence we could say was actually a set of triplets each of those is a codon. The mRNA we made is a codon as well, okay? But we've got DNA codons and mRNA codons. And we're expecting that you'd be able to translate from any of those, okay? So we're gonna be able to work from the RNA out to the protein, or we could translate back the way, or we could also kind of reverse transcribe. So we'll go from our RNA back to our DNA, and transcribe from our DNA to our RNA. So you have to be able to go ATT, ATGC going to AUGC, and then we need to be able to go to the amino acids. And I say this is one way they can show you with this little circle. You sometimes get it as a as a table. Lots of different ways that you could get the list. So we need something that actually does the translation, though. It's all very well saying that we've got something that says AAA gives us a particular amino acid, we need something that actually does that job, that decides, okay, I've got AAA, how do I make it into an amino acid? Enter tRNA. Okay, so tRNA, transfer RNA, is it's a pretty amazing little molecule, actually. You've got millions of these floating around inside your cytoplasm all of the time. And what they're doing is looking for the amino acid that goes with their anticodon. Okay, so the anticodon is the opposing complementary sequence to the codon that we had in the RNA. So in this one, we've got a GGC anticodon, which means that it would be hooking up to, if we had our mRNA sequence, it would be hooking up to a CCG. Okay, that CCG will link to whatever the code is for that amino acid. 
So your tRNAs are floating around trying to find the exact amino acid that fits for the anticodon, which is complementary to the codon. It's like the dictionary line. It's the one that actually says this means this. OK, and the only thing you need to know about tRNA in terms of structure, you can see it's quite a complicated wee structure, but all you need to be able to, to say about it is it's made of RNA and it has two sites, the anticodon and the amino acid attachment site. They are the only two things that you need to be able to talk about it. OK, and then it does its job. So every single amino acid will be carried by its specific tRNA and then that tRNA will lock on to the RNA mRNA and make this translation happen. OK, I'm going to apologise right now for this. Probably going to get quite messy and scribbly, but I'm trying to show it as a doodle first because I think that shows it a little bit better. OK, so here is our ribosome. It's got this kind of characteristic big blob, little blob thing going on. And here is our mRNA. So our mRNA has code on it. Now, what's really important is that the ribosome connects on to the mRNA covering two sites. Now, by a site, I mean a codon. OK, so here we've got there's codon one and there is codon two. So in the mRNA, let's see, just for making it easier for, for doing stuff, this is AAA and this one is CCC. OK, and then next one we'll go GGG and then like UUU just to be fair. OK, so this would keep going for quite some time off the end of the slide. OK, so the ribosome locks on so that you can fit over two codons. So what we now need is the tRNA because the tRNA, remember, does the actual translation. So what we need is a tRNA molecule. And I'm going to make the simplest one that we can possibly draw here would be something like this. OK, this means amino acid. And here's our anticodon kind of feet so that it can fit on. So here we've got for this one, if I was looking for an AAA, I would need an anticodon UUU. So this tRNA attaches in here. Now it's held here because we know that tRNA doesn't like to be in a double bond because RNAs just don't like to do that. But because it's being held inside the protein complex, with our RNA, let's be clear that ribosomes are quite a complicated thing, um, it will stay there. OK, now we need another tRNA to come in. This tRNA would be GGG with its amino acid. Now that amino acid will be a different amino acid because it's a different code. OK, now th these amino acids are now right next to one another. They are being held in a perfect conformation for them to make a peptide bond. And this is the start. Now you've got the tricky bit, OK, because what now needs to happen and we'll see if I can manage to get this to work nicely. OK, what now needs to happen is the ribosome needs to move along one. OK, so the ribosome has now shifted along a codon. OK, so it's gone three bases along. Now, this means that we can now bring in a third tRNA with its amino acid and we'll get another peptide bond and we can keep going along and this will just keep happening. It will keep on moving along. But what's also happening is that these are now stuck on the outside. So this this bit of mRNA is now exposed and this tRNA at this end does not like being stuck in a double. So it will try and let go. In fact, it will do it quite well. This whole thing will break off. But the peptide bond here is still holding the amino acid. So this tRNA basically rips off, leaving its amino acid over here. So the amino acid is now stuck still. Well, can this one work? There we go. The amino acid is now stuck to the original amino acid on this side. OK, sorry, put the ribosome back in. And this, I mean, this tRNA will just go floating off until it can find its amino acid, the one it was missing, the one that it fitted. And then it can come back into another AAA that needs it and give away its, its peptide again. And it will just keep on doing this. And what you'll do is get more and more of these bonds forming until at the far, far, far end, let's assume we've got a little bit, this is 
close and this is far away, and we've got our little codes down this end, you will have a tRNA on this side, tRNA down here, oh, where we going? with its amino acid and its amino acid stuck to it. And this one will have loads of them connected out here. And it could be a few, could be dozens, could be hundreds. OK, and this polypeptide chain, this one here, this is the start of a protein. That polypeptide chain is not a fully folded protein yet, but you are pretty close at this point. OK, hopefully that's helped a bit. This is another diagram of translation, much more neatly drawn. And it actually shows the reality of we have three sites inside the ribosome. This third site is the one where it's falling off. This is the exit site. But what you've got is these other two where we're getting a join. So this one here, the valine and lysine are going to join together and then it's going to shift along one and we're going to lose the next bit. And here's our empty tRNAs over here. They've released their amino acid. They are way to go and get some more. And here are your full uh, tRNAs over here. OK, your full tRNAs have their amino acid attached that is appropriate to their anticodon. OK, might need to go over it a few times, but that is translation.